So, having spent the last two days talking about um, consequentialism and, and deontology and, and uh, virtue ethics and eudaimonia and human flourishing and well-being, you probably noticed that we're already running late. And therefore, I'm worried about your well-being. So, if, if you feel moved, if you feel like we're intruding upon your, uh, your flourishing at this point, just raise your hands and let me know and I'll move people along a bit faster. This is Lawrence Krauss. Now Lawrence is the um, foundation professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration Department of Physics, but more importantly for me at least, he's the director of the ASU Origins Project at Arizona State University. He's also chair of the board of sponsors of the Bull Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which is a very important place to be in these um, um, dodgy nuclear times. Um, so Lawrence is actually kind of a public intellectual as, w as well as being the only physicist to receive the highest awards from all three major US professional physics societies. And today, the prolific author was clutching the advanced copy of his new book, Quantum Man, Richard Feynman's Life in Science. This is Lawrence Krauss. Thank you. Thank you, Ro thank you, Roger, for pointing out we were running over time just before I began to talk. I really appreciate that. Um, I, um, I'm going to depart from uh, my tradition in a way. I, I'm not going to have any pictures. I'm going to have quotes, partly because I'm on the stage with philosophers and I wanted to appear scholarly. So um, the quote I want to start with is from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, which, which really encompasses a lot of what we've been talking about in the context of the meeting that we've been having. It's a famous quote, man is born free, but he lives forever in chains. And normally, um, that's interpreted to mean that, that humans are born in some sense with free will, but we have this social contract. We grow up in a society in which we're constrained. Um, I don't happen to think we have free will, by the way. But, but, the, but what I want to discuss is that the chains that we live in are indeed societal. And in fact, this is in some sense the heart of the debate that we've been having. Are we born free? Or, in some sense, is our morality determined by our biology and our evolution? Is our morality determined externally by the society in which we live? Those are key questions, but I want to try and take a different tack, uh, which is to argue that we're also constrained by the reality, and that reality is only determinable by science. So I would argue, in fact, that not only can science help us tell right from wrong, it's impossible to tell right from wrong without science. Uh, because science informs us of what the real world is. And until we know that, we can't make valuable, consistent statements about the world. Now, I'm going to make some quotes from, from uh, a book that was very influential for me by Jacob Bernowski called Science and Human Values in 1956. It's a book that's so important that I actually plan to try and rewrite it after this next book I'm writing now. Uh, and Bernowski said that... Uh, this is one of the quotes I particularly like. Dream or nightmare, we have to live our experience as it is, and we have to live it awake. We live in a world which is penetrated through and through by science, and which is both whole and real. We cannot turn it into a game simply by taking sides. And then he went on to say, and this make-believe game might cost us what we value most, the human content of our lives. The world today is made, it is powered by science, and for any man to abdicate an interest in science is to walk with open eyes towards slavery. And the content I want to, I want to say is not so much that science necessarily by determining neurophysiology can determine what is right or wrong, but the process of science is what has changed our values, what will govern our values, and what should govern our values. So, the, so I want to summarize the, basically my points. Our moral decisions are constrained by our biology and the social contract, both aspects of what, uh, of, of what I put in the first slide. But we are rational beings, and no consistent moral decision can be made without understanding the consequences of our actions, and science is the way we determine the consequences of our actions. It is the way to determine what is real and what is not. And therefore, it is a necessary prerequisite to having a consistent moral philosophy. And rationality should be the basis of, of a consistent morality, and there are many times when it isn't. But one of the things we've learned in actually meetings we've had in the or, associated with the Origins Project here on human uniqueness and most recently on cultural um, evolutionary biology 
uh, is that there is maladaptive behavior. Humans behave irrationally as groups. But what we've learned is that it's usually based on incomplete information about what's happening in the world around them. That with more complete information, the, beha the maladaptive behavior will go away. I would also argue that concepts such as virtue, and in fact every perceived innate belief that we have, is meaningless except in the context of our experience and empirical reality, the two aspects that science reveals to us. And finally, by science, by science I don't mean, again, the science d deriving and determining how humans behave, but the scientific method of secular empiricism. Those are the two, I, I relate the two. Basically, secular empiricism, in, it seems to me, arose out of the scientific method. It, it, it's ludicrous to pretend it, it hasn't affected our values. It has already colored our values. The values we have today are defined because of 400 years of science. We would be loath to define anyone as civilized whose ideas of justice and humanity have not evolved over the past 400 years since science has, has changed the playing field of the human intellect. It, science, I would argue, and I think Simon may disagree, underlies the Enlightenment. And it has done so not because, well, because it works. That's the reason that we are here today. Science works. It's changed the world in an effective way. It's largely meant most people live better than they did 400 years ago. And because of that, our ideas of what is right and wrong are vastly different than they were 400 years ago. I'm sure maybe Steven Pinker will be talking about it to some extent. And when we look out at societies that deny that we think are backwards, and I'll pick one as fundamentalist Islam. We, we look at people who have denied the reality of the world around them. They've turned their backs on science, and we view them as uncivilized, and they've turned their backs on science, and part of the reason that the problems are is because by turning their backs on science, they've departed from the modern world and don't have the benefits of modern technology, which has produced societies with poverty and disorder. Now, what is real? I just learned the other day one of my favorite quotes, which, which is now one of my favorite quotes, is by one of my favorite authors, Philip K. Dick, a science fiction author, he said, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, is still there. <laughs> and I think that's, that's really what science tells us, that whether we believe things or not, there, there's an external reality. And we have to learn to live with that. And uh, Bernowski put it a different way. What is truth? The sanction of experienced fact as a face of truth is a profound subject and the mainspring which has moved our civilization since the Renaissance. The common view remains the classical view, that the concepts of value, justice, honor, dignity, and tolerance have an inwardness which is inaccessible to experience. The root of this error, as he put it in 1956, goes down to the closed logic of the Middle Ages and had been formed into a system by Aquinas. But it did not share the test of truth of modern physics. For there's a gap between the intuitive and the corrected concept. For, for there, the, the gap is gaping, as he put it. Science has taught us that the world we think exists is not necessarily the way the world is. And we cannot have a consistent sense of reality without being will to, willing to force our beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around. In fact, I wore this t-shirt not just because I think it's dashing, but because um, it was given to me by my best friend, and, and it says 2 plus 2 is 5 for extremely large values of 2. And, <laughs> and this is the point. You look at 2 plus 2 for 5, we know 2 plus 2 isn't 5. But science has taught us, in fact, for large numbers, the world behaves very differently than we think it does. And it's important, if we're going to have a consistent understanding of how we're supposed to behave, we have to understand that the world is different than our intuition necessarily projects, and science has been the only way to learn about that. So the habit of truth, which is what science is all about, uh, is uh, the best description I know of it is R Richard Feynman, who I'm very fond of because, of course, he's the subject of my new book. Um, the only way to have real success in science is to describe the evidence very carefully without regard to the way you feel it should be. If you have a theory, you must try and explain what's good about it and what's bad about it equally. In science, you learn a sort of standard integrity and honesty. In fact, the ethos of science involves honesty, open-mindedness, creativity, anti-authoritarianism, full disclosure. The basis of what I would suggest is a moral society. 
Now, we had a session on, on Science Friday, much in this group, and, 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 the, and Ira Flato asked, but how can you convince people when they have strongly held beliefs? And, and I think, I, I don't know if I use this quote, but it's one of my favorite quotes. If the only tool you have is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. I'm an educator, but I happen to believe from a great deal of political experience that when you actually provide better information, people make better decisions. And education is the basis of a more consistent and just moral society. So, good, I got applause. So, let me give you in the last uh, two slides some examples. So, the stem cells are a big issue, okay? And they're a big debate. But there are certain facts that if you don't understand them, you cannot make sensible moral decisions. Blastocysts, which are, which are the things people work with, are not fully functioning embryos. They're not going to turn into human beings. The embryos destroyed in some cell research are, not going to be, are going to be destroyed anyway. They're not going to be used for reproduction. They were largely donated for research purposes, they're in storage, and they're just going to be thrown away. And finally, one of the big misconceptions the Catholic Church suffers under is that there's a moment of conception. There is no moment of conception. Uh, having gone to in vitro fertilization clinics, I was amazed to see the incredible number of steps starting from, w w from the, what you would call the fertilization process to a fully functioning embryo, and every single one of them is as important as the one before. There's no moment where you can see, where you can suddenly define a living being there. It's a continuous process. It's not a moment. And you have to recognize that if you want to ask and make sensible moral decisions about whether you believe stem cell research should be funded. Similarly, Burkas, I thought Sam, Sam might talk about it, but he said, and, and I agree with him, that, it's not, that it seems to me putting a woman in a, in a, in a bag is not a good thing. Uh, uh, but, it, but I also think you can actually ask scientific questions that, 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 you could, that are answerable, that can allow you to realize that, that, it's, that it may not be a good thing. You can ask the question, are women safer and less subject to sexual violence and intimidation if they're, if they're covered that way? I suspect the answer is no. But it's a question you can ask and study. You can ask, is their sense of self-worth improved by, by, by going into those societies? You can ask, are they freer to manifest their capabilities as human beings? Those are scientific questions one can ask and answer, and they should inform our morality. So, in conclusion, I would say that the science's habit of self-correction as a part of a continual effort to get a better handle on truth promotes a set of values that is essential for the moral health of a modern democracy. No society, no group of humans can successfully address the challenges associated with promoting peace, happiness, and harmony without learning from the experiences, from experience, what these challenges actually are and what the alternatives are for dealing with them. There is no inner, innate guidebook to deal with global warming, terrorism, AIDS, or even love or murder because these challenges arise from a constantly changing world that only empirical investigation using the methods of science can uncover. Thank you.